Tonight we have Kelly with Quantanos. Did I say that right? <laughs> Quantanus. Quantanus, Iris Setters. Uh, she's based in, where are you based out of? Um, I'm in Manhattan, Kansas. Manhattan, Kansas. Uh, so we're excited to have her on. We actually got a buddy that uh, got a pup from you. Uh, so he's been raving about it and uh, we get to, we actually get to hunt with him this year and, uh, get to see the dog work. So we're super excited for that, but, uh, I don't know who I'm more excited to watch hunt yeah. Ryan or the dog. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the dog will obviously be more fun to watch. <laughs> um, but anyways, Kelly, if you could introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure. I just hope Ryan makes you laugh more than the dog does because that would, um, so I'm Kelly Aiken. I am, um, the person behind Quantanus Irish Setters. Um, I breed and um, train and compete with my field style or field bred Irish setters, um, and I'm excited to be here. Awesome. Yeah, we're super excited to have you on. We haven't had anyone on with, with Irish setters, red Irish setters, uh, specifically someone that also runs field trials and whatnot. So extremely happy. Uh, looking forward to this episode. But what got you into uh, having a kennel with the red Irish setters? Um, so I grew up, my grandma was a professional handler of all breed dogs. Um, she competed in AKC dog shows. And so I was kind of born into that world. And when I was probably seven or eight, I um, was at a dog show and I walked up to this lady who was grooming this dog on the table. And I said, that dog's beautiful. And it was an Irish setter. And um, Every year at those shows, I would go and talk to her. And within two years or so, she had me showing dogs for her. Um, and then that was, I was hooked. That was my breed. Um, so I grew up essentially, um, I guess I, I spent um, most of my young adult years showing Irish setters. Um, I went on to show professionally um, for several years, and I still do show on occasion, special occasions um, for other people. But I, um, when I went on my second, no, uh, yeah, second deployment to Iraq, um, I decided that my two Irish setters who were showbred dogs needed to go do something productive, um, have some kind of productive job while I was away. So um, I sent them to a field trainer. And um, while I was in Iraq, they were becoming bird dogs. And so when I got back, I started hunting my two showbred dogs. And um, then I started attending the national field trial and, and several walking field trials throughout Ca the Kansas area. And I decided that I wanted something, eventually wanted something a little snappier running, a little more able to go all day um, with more ground speed and more style. So um, I have slowly drifted over the years into the field side um, more and more aggressively. So. Yeah. The, nice. The field awesome. side. Um, so how many years do you say you've been, you did show dogs for? Um, I showed my first dog when I was six years old. Um, oh, I've shown my first Irish wow. when I was about eight um, and I've shown them ever since, and I don't want to age myself too badly, oh, but I've been yeah, showing no, dogs right. for 30 years now. So. Dang, that is crazy. Yeah. What do you, I guess, what do you even do for a show dog for training it to be shown in a show? Isn't, isn't um, that what you sold Ryan was just strictly a show dog? Well, yeah, like... yeah, his dog's <laughs> never going to point a bird, so. <laughs> <laughs> so it's just, it's just the dog learning to stand still. And actually a lot of it lays over into my field training. The dogs have to stand still, um, you know, and that's part of breaking the dogs out is learning that they, they have to stand through the shot, um, stand through the fall of the bird. So, you know, the, the field dogs and the show dogs, um, you know, they just, they just have to learn. The basics and that's to stand there um and stand there with comfort and style um and presence is is kind of what i feel like lays over to both sides because you don't want either my show dogs or my field dogs standing there with their tails down looking like a bag of smashed butt <laughs> so yeah <laughs> so your transition over to the field dogs lines this seems pretty easy yeah, um, well, 
Kind of. I mean, a lot. So all of my field dogs have show dogs behind them. They started the foundation of my dogs is a dual bred bitch bred to a field um, sire. So there's and there's there's literally best in show dogs like um, several a couple generations back on on some of my biggest dogs like Reason um, and even which Reason is the mom of Ryan's dog. So okay. um, there's there's show dogs back there, um, but the transition's not easy because it's not like I have a bajillion options to choose from when I'm considering where I'm going to breed and how I'm going to go forward with my dogs. So. Yes, it's been easy for me because I knew I wanted to do it, but no, it's not easy because um, it's hard to find w what I want and um, what I can use in order to go forward with my line. How many litters do you typically do in a year? Um, one. Just one, just one, one litter. Yeah, I mean, some t like this year, I'll have zero litters. Next year, I'll, um, I'll probably have two. I have okay. two bitches I plan to breed. So I average about one litter a year. Okay. Nice. Yeah. Which and then do you take bad. do you take deposits down? I know some trainers or breeders um, do that. So Others. I don't I don't accept deposits until um, I have healthy ten day old puppies, really. Um, and I do that because I know show breeders who have taken deposits and contracts, um, and then been unable to to fulfill a puppy for that home, and they've had uh, legal action taken against them. Oh. So oh, wow. I am very cautious about accepting deposits and such until I am sure that they're the right home and I have a puppy that's going to suit them. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> it's suck. a big that deal. I, really I try too. to warn people about accepting deposits because it it's really gone wrong for a lot of people out there, a lot of breeders. So, so yeah. all the dog talk, I'm going to switch it up here a little bit. You got posted, and I don't know if you're hanging these signs up or what, but you got free cat lessons. Have you always wanted to be a cat? So yeah, are you are yeah, you giving cat time. lessons to people now? <laughs> it's on, it's on your was, page. <laughs> yeah, that's something else. People are people are so odd. Um, I don't, you know, weird yeah, might not be my word, the, but I'll yeah. say it. What the fuck is wrong with you guys? <laughs> Jeez. Yeah, when I was in home in Colorado, um, visiting my family, there was a sign outside of like a Pet Smart or something on the side of a trash can that said, um, "Giving free lessons to teach people how to be cats." Or have you ever wanted to be a cat? Call us. We'll give you free lessons. It was very no, not person, kind of that person is probably a millionaire <laughs> no, no, maybe so maybe so um or high on something yeah probably a tiktok star or something like that yeah <laughs> Who Damn. Knows? uh how many so how many field bred uh red Irish setters ha have you uh trained or uh worked with at your kennel or so i um so i'm an amateur so i don't train for other people um, so, but I have mentored and helped, um, a lot of people with their dogs and I say a lot, but really it's, it's all, um, you know, I, I relative. Yeah. Um, so I usually keep between six and eight dogs at a time of my own, um, that I'm developing or campaigning with, you know, my own dogs or whatnot. Um, and then usually like, I know that um, there's times I co-own a couple dogs with some people and they come and go back and forth between us. Um, so there's, you know, it, it all varies and whatnot. When I do something like when I go to summer camp, um, I usually have my own dogs plus the, the dog or two that I co-own. And I'll usually have a litter on the ground that I'm bringing to evaluate um, and pick my puppies that I'm going to keep onward from. So, um, you know, it depends, but usually I'm looking, when I'm on the road or when I'm at summer camp, I could have up to 15 dogs. So oh, wow. yeah, it gets pretty busy, What's but a... they're all dogs for my breeding program that I'm trying to evaluate so I can go forward. Yeah, what's, a, what's summer camp? Um, so summer camp is where I go. Um, I go to a ranch in the summer that I am part of a group, a private group that goes up there and we spend six or eight weeks um, from late July until early September um, training our dogs on wild birds up there, sharpies and, and prairie chickens, um, occasional pheasants and such. Um, and we'll do, we basically, it's a group of us that go and, and help each other train our dogs and um, prepare for the upcoming field trial season. So um, it is a dang good time. That sounds like a really good time. 
Yeah, uh, it's pretty awesome. How many how many hours a day uh, or week are you guys running the dogs, or what's it kind of consist so of? It's because we're in Nebraska, and oh. it is definitely hot there in the summer. Obviously, we're yeah. not like you know in Canada, so um, we are usually. We, we put dogs on the ground at first light every morning. So we're usually loading horses and stuff at, um, you know, at five something, 5.15 or so every morning. And we're putting dogs down on the ground anywhere between six and 6.15, 6.20, depending on the time of year. You know, obviously as fall comes, it's later and later. Um, and we run dogs until we can't. And that usually, depending on the day and, and the temperatures, you're looking at anywhere between um, 9.30 and 11 a.m. Um, we're rotating braces of dogs and and going through the motion with that. So and then after we're done, we usually come back um, to the main camp where we, you know, where we're all parked and stuff. And then we'll go do bird work with our young dogs and do some, you know, controlled training environment type stuff. Um, and then in the evening, sometimes we'll do the same thing with with um, the controlled training situations. Yeah. So, so when you're when you're at uh, summer camp. Is this where you are deciding which dogs you'll be able to campaign with? Yeah. Um, well, I mean, more so I know which dogs I'm going to campaign as far as my adult string. Um, okay. What I'm really looking to do is, um, you know, tune them up, condition them, um, help them be better bird dogs, obviously, with yeah. the wild bird contact. And then I'm also um, usually trying to sort young dogs. You know, I have two, three, five puppies at a time. And I'm trying to figure out who has that independence that I'm really looking for and who is a little more of a, you know, a good foot hunting dog that can go to a companion home slash hunting home. Yeah. So that's the biggest goal is to sort my young dogs. Okay. And what are you looking for in a campaign dog? Um. So a dog that's going to make it on my, my string is going to be um, on the edge a little too much for <laughs> some people um, <clears throat> I like my dogs to be what I call large shooting dogs um, I want them to range you know if you're thinking like the prairies um, or the sand hills I'm looking at um, four to eight hundred yards of reach you know those yeah. those significant um you know, the desire to reach out there that far and work the cover ahead, but they also have to handle and go with me. So that's what I'm looking for. I want my dogs to, um, you know, to, to be a partner, but also have that independence and that drive um, to, to go that far, that boldness to reach out there and work the cover um, at that range. So I'm looking for a little more of the, um, I'm here, but I'm out, you know, like check in from a distance, but continue on as opposed to a dog who, um, is 150 or 200 yards. You know, that's, yeah. that's not really what I'm looking for, for a, a horseback shooting dog. Yeah. So you're the place you're training at is probably just massive to be able to run yeah. your dogs. We have, in. we have a lot of opportunity, um, thanks to some very, um, generous and kind ranchers who tend to really appreciate, um, you know, us and, and we try to help them out and, um, you know, and, and make yeah. our presence worthwhile. Yeah. So as a, um, so I've, I've never had a dog that ranges that far. Um, uh, what is that? How do you like one get comfortable with your dog being out that far? What's kind of the steps or the process of, you know, do they, do you start them in close or you just let them go and let them figure it out? Or what is your process of getting them comfortable to go So out let me preface this by saying on average, most of my dogs are three to 500 yard dogs. Okay. Um, and my bigger running, my two bigger running dogs are, are you know, consistently um, reaching a little further than that, obviously. So, but wow. what we're doing is as young dogs, um, I'm taking them out in a group and I'm on my horse or on a four wheeler or whatnot or foot, 
even, and I'm going and I'm just encouraging to turn with it. You know, I'll start whistling and getting their attention and turning. And they learn to pay attention. When I make noise, that means something's changing and generally it's my direction. So um, young dogs are doing that. Then they tend to start to go through this um, asshole puppy stage where they're, you know, they, they know I'm turning and they start to blow you off. And that's when you start to formalize some things and that's going to, you know, use an e-collar to um, overlay some direction and some purpose with them. And they should all have an e-collar introduction, at least my, my dogs always do at a younger age. Um, so basically they learn to, you know, they have to learn to come to me and they have to learn to go with me. And if I don't have those, they don't get to go anywhere. And so um, all my dogs, most, not all my dogs, my dogs that I'm keeping have that, that, that something in me, in them that tells me that they're going to be able to reach the, you know, that they're a little more independent, that they have that ability. So I'm not so much encouraging them to run big as juvenile dogs, more so I'm working on their handle because I know once they start becoming mature dogs and getting that bird, bird contact, they're going to have that range. They're going to develop that range that I want. Um, you know, my best bitch reason she started as a strong gun dog. And I'd say, you know, you're looking at 150 to 250 yards, um, you know, on a horse and that's not huge. It's good. It's not huge. Um, but then, you know, as she got older, as a four-year-old, she got bigger. And as a five-year-old, she got bigger. And then this past year on foot while hunting, she'd be out, out on point at 650. Um, and she'll hold, she stands there, you know, she, we have, um, we've been on chickens and she's been out uh, for something and just stand in, you know, stand in a whole group of chickens. There's nothing like that moment. Oh, and man. Tyler Sladen was with me at that hunt. And um, we went up there and flush. And I mean, this, we all just stood there with our jaws wide, you know, a gate just because the group of chickens got up and reason was standing there just looking great. And, um, uh, but that range comes. So how it's long, gonna, how long are they holding that point when you're 600 yards away? How long does it take you to get there? Oh, if you're, if you're on foot, it takes a while. Yeah. I, mean, I was going to say like seven to 10 minutes sometimes. And I expect reason, you know, if it's a cubby, a quail, and if they're moving or if it's, you know, I don't chase roosters, but if it's a rooster and it's moving, I expect her to adjust to those birds as I'm getting up there. But I'm going to know that she's working them because my Garmin's going to say, hey, your dog's standing. And then it'll, then she'll move a foot or two or whatever. And then it says, hey, that your dog's standing. So um, as I work my way up there, I expect her to still have the birds. Um, and that's, you know, that's part of my trusting relationship with my dog. You know, she, she knows what her job is and my job is to go up and pretend that I know how to shoot birds and, and watch them fly away. Hey, we all got to try, right? Yeah, hey, A for effort. You know, the shot is the rewarding part for her. She knows that rarely am I going to actually down a bird, but the shot means something. Yeah, that means she knows she did something right because you got to shoot. Yeah, it's crazy, like, just like Tyler and I being retriever guys, the dog getting out there 600 yards, like, kind of makes me nervous just thinking about it. <laughs> Well, you know, and you have to, to hunt something like that, you got to have a, the right areas, but, but your dog should also handle if I'm, if I'm in something that's thicker, um, or if I don't have, you know, a thousand acres to work, that dog needs to adjust and she, you know, they need to handle to what we're hunting. And, and I expect my dog to be different in some, you know, some, some cover, like a, a grouse cover, um, you know, the woods, whatever they need to handle for the terrain. And, 600 yards in the prairies is not going to be what I see when I am going into thick cover um, or significant um, woods of some kind. It's not Absolutely. the same and they should know the difference. Yeah. Yeah, yeah definitely. So does, so your um, campaign season, preseason kind of starts with summer camp, getting yeah. the dogs geared up. So take us through what I guess the campaign season kind of looks like and how do you get started with campaigns? <laughs> so, um, so we start by, uh, I mean, usually what's going to happen is um, after summer camp, we'll start, we'll, we'll have at least one or two field trials picked out. Um, and we're going to start going to a couple field trials here and there throughout the, the western I mean, it's west of the Mississippi, but east of Colorado. Like I kind of just keep with, I really like the strip from um, essentially from Minnesota down through Texas. That's kind of the area I tend to stick through Missouri and, and Kansas and such. So 
I'll have a couple trials picked out and we'll we'll go hit generally they're going to be all horseback trials in the fall that's that's more so my focus um because I'm gearing up for the national and in the national for the Irish setters is is um the end of October so you know everything I do is in prep in the fall is in preparation for the national because that's the bigger picture so um I'll go to a couple trials I'll run I don't like to run my juvenile dogs a lot at field trials um, because they, that's where they learn that they can catch birds. You know, you get those cruddy flying birds at, at field trials, not the, if you're not yeah. at a wild bird trial. And they, they learn that they, they're going to fly 20 yards and go down and then they probably can't fly again. And yeah, they start catching them and then you form bad, ha bad habits. So, yeah. um, you know, I'm running them with discretion on occasion or at places that I know won't have as much bird contact. So, um, yeah. And then I gear up for, you know, I'm, I'm getting my dog's minds thinking, and then I head down to Boonville, Arkansas for our national. And from there we go into hunting season. So, you know, yeah. then we roll onto foot and then my dogs, you know, they have a change of pace and, um, everything is different for a while for them and they know the difference. So yeah. it's pretty fun for that. So what is, for a field trial they have one winner correct we're not like a hunt test where you, everybody can pass and get a ribbon a field trial is like you have top dog second dog third dog is that correct that's how it goes, so, right? yeah you'll have placements and so like for the akc field trials you generally have first through fourth place um and then for an american field um, field trial, which is now UKC, um, they over, you know, they now overlap. Um, you're going to have for a championship, you just have first and second or champion and runner up. And then um, for the rest of the field trials, generally normal field trials are going to be first through third. Yeah. So um, what, different stakes allow for different things. So what are they, your normal field trials and your national and the national, are they judging on the same things or is there differences um they they should be judging on the same you know looking for the same things um you know you're looking any a judge you know a judge should it a lot of interpretations involved yeah. in judging field trial and personal preference um you know some judges aren't going to appreciate um, a shorter running dog with a strong work, ethic, work ethic as much as other judges. And that's a shame because, you know, that's, um, you know, we can't, they can't all run at the same exact range. Like it wouldn't be fun if they were all robots and ran the same. Yeah. So, um, but generally judges want, you know, a hardworking dog who's staunch and steady on point and holds their birds and has good manners. Um, they have to handle for their handlers, you know, runoffs don't, don't win. They shouldn't win. Runoffs should not win. They do, do you, win on occasion. Do but. you choose your males by what they place in these hunt, hunt tests? Are you talking about like the males I'm going to breed to? Yes, yes. Um, Yes and no. So, um, like kind of the foundation stud behind my dogs, um, he, or behind most of my dogs, he, um, didn't have the biggest wins. He, like he never won the national, but he performed the year he, he ran in Boonville. He was from California. So the year he came to Arkansas to run at the national, I watched him go and, um, he had an infraction at 59 minutes, which means he did the wrong thing. He was running. I still remember to this moment, he was running along an edge and a covey of birds got up and left and he was upwind of them. So it wasn't like he went and ripped the birds out and he looked at the birds and kept running. And what he should have done is looked at the birds and stopped, you know, it's called a stop to flush. So he had, but so he didn't win and that dog didn't win a huge championship, but he was, he's, a, he was spectacular that day and I decided that was the dog I wanted to breed to so yes and no I mean big winning dogs are important and they matter but some of the best performances I've ever seen couldn't be used um, because of something silly and it wasn't silly because it's part of the rules but it's something just because so the new. standards they're holding yeah, absolutely right? it's forgivable yeah. So yeah. um, the bigger picture matters. And that was a performance of a lifetime for, for me to watch. So it was very influential on, on what I've done with my breeding program and where I've gone. Yeah. Nice. Do they have, so the judges, they have a breakdown of categories where you get like a five, one out of five or uh, so something? In hunt tests, they do that. But in okay. field trials, it, it there's, there's 
no, there's no like written score sheet. Um, you, you kind of have areas that you're evaluating, but honestly, I mean, a judge could say, all I'm judging is their range and use that and that only. And, and they could go for a dog that runs at 400 yards, but is always dead center and doesn't ever work the cover. And they could put technically put that up if that's really what they wanted, if they're judging a partner would agree to that. Um, so it's hard because, um, you know, it's not forcing a judge to adhere to, you know, like you have to evaluate all these certain things. And that's kind of, I mean, it's frustrating, but it's not because you learn that the certain judges aren't worth your entry fee yeah. and you don't have to go support those entries. So, um, you know, so, so you're just, you become aware of who you do and don't want to run under and you, um, enter accordingly. Yeah. So, um, that's, that's the rub. That's part of, you know, the challenge and we're paying for their opinions yeah. and if you don't like their opinion, don't run under them. That's, yeah. that's how it goes. You, so you, you said it's kind of brutal. <laughs> <laughs> well you know and there's people that won't ever run under me again and that's that's okay um you know we just don't see things the same way and that's that's the way it is so so um, you're a judge i am i've judged my fair share in the what past do, years. um so one more question before we jump in the next so there's mm -hmm. two judges per trial and yes. they have to like what do they do talk to each other and yep, so yep. come they, to an agreement generally discuss um, like I like to discuss with my judging partner after every brace, just to keep track of dogs as we go. So like after my first four dogs, I generally have an idea of first through fourth, how I'd rank them. And then as we continue on, if something beats something I have in my top four, I'm replacing them. And, okay. and so, um, you know, you're always conferring with your judge and your judge might not agree. And you guys can continue and debate that later on and, and come to, you know, sometimes you have to compromise. Hey, I'll let you have this dog in third, but I really, really like what this dog did. And that's why I'd like to flip one and two or whatever, you know, it's okay. just a communication and agreements. Yeah. So what did it take for you to become a judge? Um, so for the AKC side, I had to apprentice for um, X number of stakes, which means I had to ride along with two um, certified judges um, and listen to their reasonings and talk to them about the stake as we went and so on and so forth. Um, and then I had to take a test, a written test um, to, or a multiple choice test to um, display that I knew the, the AKC field trial rules. So that was essentially it. Um, and then you know, and then it's a matter of getting a, your first judging assignment. When somebody hears that you were approved, you kind of have to, um, you know, hope that somebody finds you and you says, "Hey, <laughs> right, right, exactly." Well, you don't want to pimp yourself, but yeah. you, you know, but but eventually someone realizes, "Hey, you're you've been approved to judge," and and a lot of it has to do with people knowing of you and your field trial history, and then finding that worthy to use you. Um, and, and for American field, there, there's no technicalities. You don't have to pass a test or anything, really. It, it comes down to people knowing you're experienced and, um, you, you, they may or may not agree with your views on watching dogs and they give you a go, you know, and hopefully you live up to their standards and do a good job judging and they find you honest and then you get used again. Yeah. Well, that is interesting. Do you... I hope Ryan can find somebody honest because I don't know if he's the honest, most honest guy. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you you you're probably going to judge him for him on his first uh, uh, trial he's doing here, aren't you? Well, I'll judge him from afar. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm always judging Ryan, but no, I'm, I'll be cheering him on though. That's you know I have not yeah. had a dog of mine go through NAVDA, and so it's a bit. I'm really, really excited to oh, see yeah. one of my dogs pursue. Yeah, that. No, I, I think he's going to do well from everything that he says he's doing, and uh, just I'm what he tells so. us. So right. should be should be fun to hear how he does, or even see how uh, Fitz does. Yeah, yeah, I'm crossing my fingers. That's for sure. Yeah. What do you think is kind of the, and maybe you've kind of answered it, but the biggest struggle or the hardest part for field trials? The financials. I mean, okay. <laughs> hands down, um, I, I put everything I have into it. And um, like I went and contracted in Afghanistan for, um, a long time so that I could afford to play this game with my own dogs. Um, it, you know, it was kind of a tit for tat. And then I ended up meeting my, uh, my partner, who's now my fiance. And he, um, 
eventually was able to go, um, you know, full time remote working. And so together we're able to travel the country and field trial our dogs and hunt our dogs. Um, but the financials are the withholding, like that's, that's what keeps us in check because if I could afford it, I would, I would field trial every, you know, every weekend that I could other than hunting season. Like that's when I, what can, I, my can I ask what's the cost to get into trialing? Cause I, Let so me, I've done HRC and I believe it was yeah. like, I think it was like a hundred dollars for Saturday and stuff. <laughs> She's laughing like that's I nothing. I think <laughs> no, is what no, I paid. And then obviously cool. I had that's gas really and you got to stay in a hotel and right. all that Absolutely. stuff. And, you know, so it's probably, I don't know what I spent five, six hundred dollars just for a weekend between food, gas and hotel and then the entry fee, maybe. Right. It was, it was eight years ish ago. So <laughs> a long time so, ago I did it. So like a general weekend field trial might cost between uh, 50 and $70 for your, for one dog's entry. Um, and that's, that's for one stake. And usually you can run dogs in multiple stakes. Um, so you're looking at basically we'll say 55 per entry, 60, whatever. Um, and then yeah, you, if multiply, you have multiple dogs. If, well, when you have seven dogs to enter, Yep. So, and then you get Jesus. gas and everything. We haul, um, we have a, uh, 32 foot horse trailer with living quarters in it. So we don't have a hotel, but we do have fuel to ha haul that. Um, and then we have the three horses plus the dogs and everything. Um, so it, it gets expensive. Ooh. Absolutely. And your, your gas, you're probably happy. driving what at 2,500 at least. No, 30, yeah, 3,500. 3, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, but, you know, I started all these years ago with my van. I had a, she I have a, well, I had a Chevy van. You put a horse in a van? And, <laughs> right. Shetland pony. <laughs> right. But, like, I used to haul a two-horse bumper pole um, that my barn owner owned. She'd let me use it. And I'd haul my one horse in that van with my dogs. And I'd sleep in the van. Like, you know, I, I made it work because it was so important to me to be doing it. It was just, you know, I knew I needed to be doing it. So I did what it took. And I'm, you know, rape, pillage, and plum, you know, what rape, plunder, pillage, whatever, all the things. Like, I would just do anything to do it. So, um, you know, that's, I, I did what I had to do, but it was, it was not as expensive back then. Um, it's obviously because I've upgraded what we're, how we're doing it. It obviously costs more now, but, um, yeah. you know, the walking field trials are where your average dog owner can compete and usually make the costs work, especially if they're semi-local and can, you know, do a hotel for one night or whatever. Or if you find a buddy who's also going, you share a room, share fuel expenses, you know, that's, that's the walking trials are where it's at for normal people that don't have, you know, the desire to commit this much expense, um, in, into the sport. So yeah. are there any trials close to you? So you can just like go back home. Cause I know there's a few around here <laughs> where you could, yeah. I could go to one and come back home and then go to one the next, I'd have to leave at like five in the morning, but it, it would be, right. it would be doable. Yeah, we have, there's a couple of them. Um, they're American field trials. So, um, and, and they're within an hour. So that's, that's definitely doable. But honestly, at the end of the day, like to, to load up horses, my horses don't live with me. We live in, you know, the horses live at the barn. So. Oh, we lost you. trailer and spend the night there um even if it's only an hour away it's just easier yeah it doesn't make any sense to burn up the gas and all no. that when you can just right. stand right there I exactly agree it's cheaper but yeah. like for me if i was just taking my dog I have right. horses that, and everything then that's super are the the walking trials and the horse trials are they much different or is it just basically no horse and you're walking it's, it's essentially no horse and you're walking and your, your range obviously should be, a, um, potentially a little different. Um, like my dogs are still going to run big, but they're not going to be as big because I'm not going as fast because I'm walking and they can't see me because I'm on the ground as opposed to on a horse. So they should be checking in a little more. They should be a little more visible and they should show better. I'm also communicating with my dogs a little different. So they, but they know they really do adjust um, if I'm on foot, they, you know, they know the difference. They're playing a different game. They're doing it differently. So, um, but you know, the dogs you see at the walking trials every weekend 
are generally not the dogs you're going to see at the horseback field trials every weekend. Um, yeah. There's there's crossovers like myself. There's crossovers that do both, but it's not above. You know, it's not normal per se. It's not the norm. Yeah. What a. Uh, what's it like, or how do you train your dog to work with you on horseback compared to standing there or walking? Is there many big differences or? No, I think, I think if anything, it's just the experience of when I got to get on a horse, they realize that we can go faster because, Hey, you know, you're able to keep up a little more so I can go a little more. Um, you know, and, and it's kind of like, I mean, I don't know if you guys ever ride four wheelers with your dogs, um, or take your dogs out while you're riding a four wheeler, but they, they, they're, you know, it's a little more exciting because you're going a lot faster and it inspires them to go and be a little wilder. So, I mean, they, they cross over pretty quick. They learn, they learn that, um, you know, it's, it's a little more fun for them, um, to, to go that way. So. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I just didn't know if there was handling difference in handling or anything with. Yeah. Yeah. I would say, I would say there is, um, you know, when, when I'm handling my dogs, um, when they're out there and doing the right thing, I tend to be quiet, um, except for when I'm changing direction, if I'm on a horse, um, if I'm on foot and they've been gone, gone a while, I'm going to, I'm going to start calling a bit, um, to kind of bring them around to ch- for them to show them to the judge for them to check in and they don't have to come all the way back to me, but I'm probably a little louder on foot than I am on a horse, um, basically because, um, of of what I'm trying to do and how I'm trying to show my dog yeah. so how many you... dogs are usually at these events roughly? um like on a weekend trial you can have anywhere from like 70 to 110 dogs um or entries I should say 70 to 110 entries yeah. you know in numbers can vary in, in how big the club is to be able to run that and everything but you'll see that as a as a normal range yeah so wow. do is that is there a lot smaller when you get are there any trials that are specific just wild bird oh yeah trials? absolutely okay. yeah the, and those tend to be championships more i mean there are regular field trials that are wild birds only but but more so championships are wild birds um and those are going to be held i mean everywhere from the grouse woods up in the northeast to the chucker championships out west um the prairie championships to the north in like north dakota etc um those are all wild bird tri- trials so um yeah. wild birds only you won't find any crappy flying quail yeah and you've done the the wild bird ones um so <laughs> i've judged several wild bird trials okay. now well uh, two wild bird trials now, um, but I have not run my dogs in wild bird trials. Are, the, so this, are those a lot know. more expensive to be in? Yes, yes, they are. Um, it's also location is harder. Um, we have one wild bird trial here in Kansas, um, and I have not been able to go there due to like usually it conflicts with a different field trial that I'm at. Um, but the ones up north. It's hard because like you get, um, there's one trial every um, early September and it's in Montana and I think it's Montana and um, it's, it's really, really hot there every year. Like, uh, yeah, circle Montana, I believe. And it's, it gets incredibly hot there every year. And when you're running red dogs, um, it's not always as easy to get them to last. Yeah. Just a little, you know, it affects them a little more. Um, So it's, it's just not been conducive now if that was you know later in the fall I think I'd be a little more prone to going um but you know we're hopefully going to go and compete at at least one wild bird trial this year it's it's time it's time you know we I hunt hard I train on wild birds um and I'd like to to show that my dogs can do that on wild birds yeah do they uh is it all on private ground or is there public land involved with that as well? Um, those are usually on private ground. So um, private ranches and stuff that allow us to, to take part. There's some, like in Wisconsin, there's some um, public grounds that um, are where they hold wild bird trials. Um, but that's not, I don't think that would be the normal. Usually I think it's on, on mostly private grounds. Yeah. Do you find with the wild bird ones... So I'm guessing these these private grounds that they're at are thousands of acres that people have. Yeah. Yeah. Do you 
so on the on the wild birds so i'm guessing the ones that aren't wild they probably have like a select area that you're kind of in on the mm -hmm. on the wild birds um obviously they're wild so when yeah. they fly they might fly a long ways yeah and and so how do they how do they do that with do they have different like let's say these five dogs are going to run in this uh, square mile per se and these dogs gotcha. are going to run so so basically they have a designated course and like for the ones that i've specifically been a part of it's been three one hour courses and you each 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 brace runs for one hour on their course and that course is basically a path and it's not a path but it is a path it's like hey you go from here you see those hay barns you go around that and you hit the you know the water tower over there and whatever whatever or the windmill um and then you go towards the fence line and whatever so there's kind of a designated course and you, there's three of them and you run three um three braces in the morning and then three braces in the afternoon and what you do then expect is usually those birds that have been pushed out during their brace in the morning have returned or other birds have come into the area um and I mean, I, for the most part, I mean, usually you're thinking you're going to be super excited to have the first brace in the morning because you think those birds have been roosting and whatnot and are going to be more plentiful, but that's not necessarily the case. A lot of times we'll see more, you know, you'll see just as many or more birds in the afternoon, um, you know, moving from feeding and, and whatnot. And, and just like you would while, while hunting, um, you know, conditions obviously can affect that greatly, but yeah. Um, but yeah, you'll you'll use the same course twice each day, at, at least with the ones that I've experienced. And then as a judge, so would you look at uh, dogs differently? I don't know if that's the right term or right. would you look at them differently on a wild bird course over a non wild bird course? Like, I guess, are you looking kind of at the same thing or you know wild bird course same same kind of picture like if i watch um you know a group of dogs run in a wild bird trial and then i'm watching them at a planted bird trial um you you know you're obviously looking for the same things but the cream of the crop is going to rise in my opinion in a wild bird trial because you were more inclined to go birdless at a yeah. wild bird trial in in my you know from from my thoughts and the dogs who find those wild birds are more exciting to me as a judge than the dogs who just you know who can find birds at a planted bird trial like yeah. Yeah. it's just you know it, it's a little it's it's just more a little real. more heavy step yep exactly yeah. it's more Do real. You, have you been to a wild bird one or judge wild bird one where they didn't find a bird oh yeah absolutely like and those situations really suck um <laughs> Oh, and sometimes it's the you know certain years can be really hard on those on those bird populations and they've canceled trials so, you know in, in years past because mm -hmm. it's too hot or the bird numbers are really down and they don't want to pressure those birds and and that's the respectable and the right thing to do is because you don't want to ruin a bird population or risk you know risk your dog and horses and the birds over yeah. um, the chance to potentially win a trial like there's always there's going to be more trials yeah. so um, you know people don't want to spend a lot of money to get somewhere where they're not going to be able to see birds yeah. it's just not, it's not a win-win for anybody and so if they if they don't see a bird is it just a, a no score or just nothing yeah like really if you go them birdless, them? if you're at a, if you're at a, a championship and you go birdless you're you you're not gonna you're not gonna be you should not be beating dogs who find birds yeah. Yeah, those, those, you're, you're bird, right that like, makes sense first and foremost we're looking for bird dogs and there's times that you get a placement and you don't find birds but there's conditions and such to attribute to that and generally if you're going to place and not have birds other dogs aren't going to have like there's not going to be bird finds in that trial and that happens um at certain places given you know depending on the cover and, and the pre-release birds and so on and so forth and that's in planted trials so yeah, um yeah. you know you, you don't want to live without birds you don't want to place without birds you want those bird contacts because we are running bird dogs yeah, so. absolutely it's kind of like uh it is you know we've had some people on this and you can you know as a a good trainer can take a mediocre 
dog and get them through more planted bird hunt tests, not trials, yeah. a little different. Yeah. But like, I think the wild bird ones, you'd really flush out the, you know, maybe yeah. the, the lesser, the not the cream, cream of the crop, of the crop like you said. Gonna rise, but, yeah. um, and, and the subpar dogs show themselves yeah and it's amazing what you see those those dogs who aren't performing at those wild bird trials it's amazing when you see how much they win at planted bird trials it's it's eye-opening yeah a bit is there uh do people get winnings for like these championship trials <laughs> um or is it just like so my dog's a champion so honestly in, now in he's... the AKC world you're not winning money okay. um you know, you might win like a gift card or something, a gift certificate, yeah. but, but you're not oh, winning right. money, right? Like, yeah. hey, here's a free dinner for you. Yeah. Um, in the American field world, there usually is a purse, um, especially in championships. You're getting, you can get some significant purses. So, um, and those purses don't always go to the handler. You have the scout, which is the person that's kind of helping you with your dog. Um, you usually are rewarding your scout with some money or whatnot. Um, the owners generally don't have anything to account for with their wins. They're not getting the money. The handler and the scouts are where the money's going to go to. So what's this, what's the scout do? Um, so the scout is the person that's basically like the handler has to stay on course and go and, and, and handle their dog. The scout, you know, when a dog goes out of sight and goes on point, like as a handler, you want to stay on course. You don't want to have to go look over every, around every corner, every time your dog goes out of sight to see if they're point, on point. Your scout's job is to go and find your dog on point or to help the handler know where their dog is so they can continue to bring their dog to the front and run the, the field trial course. So when they, oh. so when you're running field trials, you're not running like a GPS collar on them or anything? We have GPS collars on them. Usually most people do. Um, okay. The trackers are turned off. So oh. you will not have your tracker turned on. You can't use your tracker. So um, if your dog is not, um, if your dog's out of sight or out of um, pocket and not seen for a, like a significant amount of time, they're out of, they're generally out of contention. Um, the only way to really overcome that is to find your dog on point in, to the front. Yeah. So um, how do you, um, what, what do you, I guess, what do you use for, are you recalling your dog at all in these trials when you're wanting them to get out six, 800 yards to come back and check on you, or are you just letting them work and hoping that they're going? Yes. Well, yes and no. If you're turning, you're recalling, you're, you know, you're going to get your dog's attention and make them come around okay. to you. If they're, if they're in danger, you're going to recall them. Yeah. Um, you know, if there's a road, you, you want to call your dog, but otherwise, you know, you're just, you're just sending them out there and hoping they find birds. Yeah. So, Hey, my battery is about to die. I need to grab my charger. No I'm worries. Really we can pause quick. Okay. Okay. Give me three minutes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we're talking about the the dogs ranging out six eight hundred yards, and you don't have collars, can't see where they're at, and during right. your trials, how you're going about handling them, because obviously you don't have a collar to. I guess when you're hunting, is your hunting norm, you know, regular hunting season, is your handling different than when you're handling during trials? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, so like if I'm hunting, I don't have a scout to go find my dog for me. Yeah. And there's certainly not, if I do have somebody hunting with me, they're generally going to be on foot as well, unless we're hunting on horseback, which is different, obviously. But um, I'm going to, I mean, my, so like my dogs that might be a little younger or whatnot, I'm going to keep them in verbally I'm going to talk more because when I talk more they're closer they're going to check in more um and and I'm not hacking and I'm not like I don't like making a lot of noise when I'm hunting but um you know I'm watching my my Garmin which is on my watch obviously yeah. I'm watching my Garmin to make sure my dogs are going to be coming with me um you know if I'm turning or whatnot if I'm taking a you know if I'm crossing a fence line I'm going to handle them through that if they're at a field trial um you know 
I'm not going to cross certain areas until I collect my dog and have them. If I'm hunting, like my dog is going to get there eventually. And it doesn't matter if they come from lateral or behind, it, you know, it's not going to affect me as much. You know, I'm not going to lose a hunt because my dog is, you know, really far off to the hard right as opposed to in front of me. So, um, you know, it just, it just, it affects how, where I want my dog to be and, and how um, there I let them apply themselves. So yeah. do you think your, your dogs transition pretty well from trialing or let's say hunting season to trialing season? Cause kind of, would you say during hunting season, they may have a little more, I don't want to say lenience, but your expectation of them is maybe different than trialing. Yeah. Yeah, they do. They tend to like, I mean, I'll talk about reason because she's my steady Eddie and, and predictable. Um, when I'm hunting and if I shoot a bird, reason breaks to go get that bird at the shot. Um, she, I mean, unless I am ready to, to correct her or tell her to stand through it. Yeah. Um, when I'm at a field trial, you know, I fire that shot and she, she better not move. She, she sure should know better than to, to, to go anywhere to pursue any game like she's going to go, you know, retrieve it or whatnot. She knows the difference. So, yeah. and, and all my dogs should, um, you know, they they should all have enough birds shot for them and then realize, you know, during hunting season and realize that it is very different than field trial season. Um, but I do generally, um, I don't allow any of my young dogs to retrieve because, it makes the crossover easier. Now with my older dogs, like Reason, once they're four or five and really have it all figured out, then, then they get away with going, you know, going to retrieve uh, because they know they, they've learned the difference and they've earned that ability to, to go retrieve that bird. And they know the difference between, you know, when I down a bird like that and when we get back on our horse, horse and go forward and, and continue to be competitive. Yeah. So, so in, in the trials, are you guys are you guys shooting actual live ammunition or are you using poppers? So it depends. There's, okay. um, there are retrieving stakes. Um, and some of those stakes allow for killing a, a bird on course. Um, some of those stakes bring you back for a callback for the retrieve. Um, and then some stakes are non-retrieving, which means it's just a blank gun. Okay. So, um, you know, there's all three, you can choose where you run your dogs, um, setters and pointers don't have to have retrieves um, in order to become field champions in AKC. Um, the rest of the breeds um, have to have retrieving, like have to have placements at a retrieving stake in order to become field champions. And that's because they're viewed as the more versatile dogs, like your Weimaraners, like your okay. uh, V-shirts, like your short hairs, yada, yada, yada. Yep. I did not know that. <laughs> That's interesting. I didn't either. Crazy. So, so those ones, they have to run, uh, so they have to run like a, a multiple test or can they get be? I guess, how long does it take to be a field champion? How many trials do you have to do? Um, well, so you have to be a certain number of dogs, um, okay. kind of, um, you have to get 15 points, or sorry, 10 points. I was thinking of shows, 15 for shows, 10 points to become a field champion in America, in AKC. Okay. Um, and so, and then there's also a difference between an amateur and an open field champion, um, AFC versus FC. So FC is field champion, AFC is amateur field champion. Each title requires 10 points. Um, one of those has to be a major, which means three points or more. The maximum points you can get is five points. So technically a dog who wins first place at two super large trials or stakes could get two five point majors and finish in one day, technically, oh. um, or in one weekend. But yeah. generally you're running in trials and um, sometimes it's like one point, you know, if, it, if it's eight dogs, it's one point. If it's, um, you know, if it's 13 dogs, that's a three point major. You usually try to, you, you hope that all your trials are going to be 13 dogs. Um, so you're just, you're just trying to get those points together and you have to win, um, you know, win first place to get those points, um, except for if they're larger trials, if you have a larger entry, second place or third place sometimes gets a point or two points, depending okay. on how big the trial is, but you're shooting for 10 points. Yeah. Nope. That makes sense. So, so based on number of dogs and other circumstances, all that. 
and then so the so back to the re, the ones that are the retrievers compared to the setters are they running in the same are they running different stakes than what the setters are are i don't know if i lost you i'm there sorry no worries um okay. what no, was your question sorry. my my question was are the um the other versatile breeds running mm -hmm. different stakes than what the setters are or are they still in like the same class but have different requirements i don't know if that makes so, sense so yes it does um, so they can run, basically you choose what stakes you run in. Um, so they can get points from, um, like non-retrieving stakes. They absolutely can. Um, but they also have to have points from retrieving stakes. So, okay. um, so that's, that's how that goes. Or they have to have, I don't know what they call them now because it's not, they don't have to win a stake. They have to place in a stake retrieving credits. So they have okay. to have a placement in a retrieving stake. Okay. Um, and I don't know about the specifics of how many credits they need because I don't own those breeds. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, but, no. um, but like most trials that I go to um, are non-retrieving yeah. trials. And um, there's always going to be short hairs, um, sometimes wire hairs, definitely, usually vishlas and so on in those stakes. Um, and, and they're running just like I am trying to get their points. And then they usually are also, they'll go to a different trial and try to get the retrieving credits, um, you know, at a retrieving trial, so. Yeah. And at these trials, uh, obviously you said the wild bird ones you're running in our stake, I think is what you, uh, Yeah, usually that's the right terminology. Stake. Okay. Is yeah. that what it is on basically all, all around like the nationals and everything, is it? Yeah, like most of your championships, our national championship is an hour. Um, your classics, which are are, are generally hours, um, but your weekend stakes are usually thirty minutes. Okay. Um, that can vary depending, but like AKC is almost always thirty minutes, um, unless it's a championship or a classic. Yeah, well, that makes sense. What's been with getting into switching from show breed to the field lines? running these trials, hunting, what's been one of your most fun experiences or something that stuck out the most? Um, I, I, Oh, you muted yourself. There you go. Two things that really stick out to me. Um, one is when my show dog, I used to hunt her a lot and she was really good on quail and I was hunting in one of my favorite places. And this, this truck drove by really slow as I was loading up my dogs one day. And they turned around and drove back really slow. And I was like, what are these people doing? Like, are they trying to take the spot I'm hunting at? Like, I'm literally just hunted this, whatever. And finally they come back and they said, does that dog hunt? <laughs> and I was just like, no, no, I was just taking it on a walk with a gun. Like, yeah. I don't know what you expect me to say. So, um, <laughs> It's just, it was, it's pretty fun. It was pretty fun to hunt with my show dog back in the day. Um, she, you know, she was a really good quail dog. Yeah. Um, and that meant a lot to me. Um, but I think my, my favorite moment with um, field dogs would be not at a field trial, but um, when I had two friends come up from New Mexico and Arizona, that was Tyler um, and his friend, Phil, and they came up and stayed with me. Um, for opening weekend of chicken season and we went and chased chickens and that's when reason um, you know we were it was opening morning and we're at this field and there's it's a big area and there was you know we we could see other hunting groups and nobody was doing anything and you know they're walking but you don't hear any gunfire or anything and um, the Garmin beeps and reasons on point and we walk up there and we're all just kind of, you know, blah, 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 laughing, talking, whatever. And we get up there and we all stop and look at her and we're talking, okay, yeah, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden the group of chickens get up and there was probably 30 to 40 chickens. And I'll, I'll never forget this moment. It's just the way the dog was silhouetted on the top of this hill. And it was, I mean, it was just beautiful with the birds getting up all around her and we're just 
standing there looking like idiots with guns in our hands and not firing. And we're just, our jaws are agape and we all kind of look at each other like, holy crap, that just happened. And then we're like, oh my God, we're all idiots. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> shot. We were so mad at each other. Like we're all just stupid for freaking losing that moment. And we just see all these chickens get up and we're like, that was awesome. It was just so awesome. And then we're like, oh, we're so stupid. So <laughs> that that's a moment that I will never, ever forget. Um, you know, that's, it just engraved in my brain. So probably yeah, that's cool. my favorite hunting moment, despite the lack of actual hunting. So yeah, that is awesome. That sounds really fun. That does uh, sound cool. One other question before we, before we, uh, in the podcast, but did, have, you know, you said your, your show, um, setter was a really good quail dog and it was absolutely trained for hunting. Mm -hmm. Um, did you notice when you switched to a field dog compared to your show dogs, did you notice it for hunting purposes, not trial purposes, for just right. strictly hunting purposes, did you notice a huge difference in the dog's abilities to perform, to find birds, to yeah, in ab- their coat, maybe not collecting as many birds, I don't know. Right. Um so, so yes, there's there's definitely some some significant differences that I would know. Um, the first and foremost is um, my show dog. She was a I'd call her a, a a nice gun dog. I mean, she'd reach out and she'd hunt and stuff, but she was never over two hundred yards, which is fine because I'm on foot and that's that's not offensive. That's productive, especially if she's finding birds at that range. But she could not maintain the speed for the the longevity of our hunts um she was really a half day dog um and if I did more than that I couldn't use her the next day it just she just didn't have the ability to last for the type of hunting we were doing and the you know for the amount of hours we were putting in and and we hunt when I'm hunting I'm hunting hard like we're you know it's it's all day yeah. we're going so did she weigh um, a lot more too what's that did she was she a lot bigger like yeah she's she was probably 65 pounds whereas my average um bitch is probably closer to 38 to 42 pounds so you know she's she's 20 plus pounds more was 20 plus oh, pounds. Wow. so um you know and she didn't have the style she was a level tailed dog which is a lot of people appreciate and I liked what she looked like but she yeah. was not you know it, it just wasn't the same um you know she didn't have the snap when she ran but she had a great worth at work ethic and she she wanted to do whatever it is that I asked her to do. So that work ethic was there. She just didn't have, you know, she didn't cover the ground um, as easily and it was harder on her. And um, yeah. that was probably the biggest difference for me. Um, whereas these dogs should be able to go um, faster, harder, further, Please. longer. Yeah. And they should last, especially if they're in shape. Yeah. So. Nice. Awesome. Well, Kelly. This has been great. A lot of information. Uh, yes, thank you so much. Apologize for my have... in and out <laughs> on the podcast. <laughs> no worries. Obviously, if we have like questions pop up that come to us and uh, we feel we need to bring you back on to get these answers, hopefully you'd be up for doing that. Um, absolutely. Maybe doing a, sorry, a round was... two. Yeah, absolutely. It was. I'm sorry it wasn't super exciting. You know, I'm not always oh, very super I interested. I thought this was great. I, I mean, you know, I like answering questions and helping people understand. Yeah. Like I said, I, I've, I've never been around the field trial world, so I didn't know any of it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you guys rode horses and uh, whatnot, but no, I, this has been, been really helpful, really good. Like I said, excited to get to hunt over one of your dogs. Um, this yeah. Year and, uh, I hope he doesn't. <laughs> he uh, I, I think he's done good. I think Ryan's too nervous and to make him not any good. Yeah. Um, so excited for that. Excited to get to experience that. I've never hunted over a, a setter of any sort before. So well, cool. I'm excited. I hope he does a good job. And I hope you guys are so impressed that you're like, you know, our next dog is going to be an Irish setter. <laughs> you're going to have to, you're going to have to convince my significant other. They're she's so a, pretty. They're so yeah. pretty. <laughs> if, she's never seen one in person. So we'll see what, uh, we'll see what her feedback is if 
I told Ryan because he keeps trying to talk me to him like you're gonna have to bring him over so that yeah. way she can she can see him I'm like pictures don't do it justice she needs no, to see him in person do. so <laughs> Uh, but yeah no we're looking forward to it and again we appreciate it um uh, and we'll uh keep in touch and look forward to seeing how you do on your trials this year okay thank you guys i appreciate your time yep you have a good night you too Bye-bye. Bye-bye.